what were the objects or the, the text or you know, what, what part did you stop and go, whoa? I thought that the map, the, to scale of his entire plantation in the back was really, really in interesting. In that second room there? Yeah. Well, what was it that the... the uh, well, there are two parts. One, um, obviously his house is so built on that hill, it's almost like on a mountain, compared with his farmlands, I thought, that's interesting, yeah. management-wise. He's got kind of like a little town up yep. near his house, and yet he's got these dispersed um, houses throughout like the farmlands. And then I started thinking, did he give his slaves who lived in those farmhouses some what of an autonomy as they were farming yeah. those areas? Because his house was miles away, you know, on top. Um, so. Mulberry Row, I think, is very important. It's a 1,300-foot uh, space on the northeastern side of uh, the, the house. Uh, if this is Monticello here, uh, and this is um, um, the, the north here, uh, and this is the east, here is, here is Mulberry Row. Somewhere around 20 homes is what it had on it, domestic spaces, as well as uh, there was a nailery, there was a blacksmith shop, there was a textile um, uh, shop, there were domestic houses, uh, dairy. You, you either worked as a domestic, you either worked as a tradesman or a craftsman, or you worked in the fields. Generally, those were the three areas. Mulberry Road became a real proving ground to determine which one of those might be your fate. Mulberry Row, between 12 and 16, Jefferson would engage them in work, males and females, at Mulberry Row. And he would use that to make some determination about where the aptitudes were and where he would then assign uh, those who he had working there. And then he uh, bought a variety of people from around the country and even outside of the country, Scottish, uh, tradesmen and craftsmen to teach the enslaved at Monticello a variety of the skills. Uh, so a variety of those um, were sort of um, determined based on the experience at Mulberry Row. And then how is the other way that you encountered, um, you know, enslaved uh, people at Monticello? Through their lineage. Okay. Whose? I mean... Well, the most famous would be the Hemings. Mm -hmm. There was... Um, the Grangers. 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 That second part of the exhibit are the six families. That struck me as another choice. You know, how, what are we going to do? And instead of trying to cover all 600, they made this choice about we'll pick six. One well known and maybe some that are less well known. But we'll really focus on that, you know, just on those families' experiences. Now, these families. George Granger is the only man I know that was actually assigned to be an overseer at Jefferson. During Jefferson's lifetime, he must have had over 30 uh, overseers on the property. Granger was the only one uh, that, um, uh, that he had that was from the black community. And Granger was one of those we use at least to suggest that Jefferson wasn't someone who was so struck by color until he didn't understand that it was merit that was the most important in terms of whom he allowed to do work and whom he allowed freedoms and whom he did not allow freedoms. But there is an argument to be made for the precedent of the Hemings family. There were five generations of that family on the hill. Over 70 people in that family on the mountain uh, started with Elizabeth uh, Hemings, who was the matriarch of the family, and five generations of her family were at Monticello. The Hemings were uh, treated differently. They were given freedoms no one else was given. Uh, uh, several of them were even allowed to not only work, but to live off the mountain and also to sort of move around as free people, even though uh, they were owned by Jefferson. Uh, you will find the Hemings were the ones who did either the least work or worked as domestics or received privileges that others uh, did not receive. And then finally, for me, the Fawcett family. Uh, and they were also Hemings, but um, they were the grandson of, Joseph Fawcett was the grandson of Elizabeth. Joseph, the reason I, I, I wanted to mention uh, him is because when Joseph was the only member of his family that was freed in Jefferson's will, uh, he set 
uh, Fawcett free, but Fawcett was not free at the time that the auction took place. So he could not bid on his family. He watched his family being sold away. But he also knew some folk in Albemarle County that he had done business with. So he made uh, 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 requests of them that they purchase members of his family and that as a blacksmith he was able to, to uh, work and, and he promised that he would, uh, you know, whatever it was that they uh, paid for the price for them, that he would then pay them back uh, the price of, uh, of, the, of his family. Somewhere in 1837, he purchased five of his children and four of his grandchildren, and they all moved back to, them all moved to uh, Ohio. The Hemings family, there were like these really nice pots, like from France. And um, I just thought that really helped paint the complex picture of Jefferson. Right. Yeah, I thought that I enjoyed learning about the families. It's interesting to see the different dynamic that that plantation would have had than a lot of others. But I thought, too, it kind of focused on the fact that these were his most skilled slaves. They have the chair that the one person built. Right. And then we had a trained French chef on us as a slave. Right. I mean, that's not normal. Yeah. You get to know those, those six families really well. But at the same time, you, you lose sight of all these people. Um, and that's a, that's a trade-off. Do you want them to, to learn a couple of people's experience really deeply? Or do you want them to get a bigger sense of you know, the, whole, the, the whole enormity of uh, uh, the operation?